Hey everyone, my name is Austin. I'm one of the virtual production team leads here at Copilot. And today, I thought I'd make a video about how to set up the Mosa Star Tracker in virtually any space. Okay, let's go. Good luck. Okay. Welcome to our research and development space. This room is basically built to be a sandbox for virtual production. It's currently in the middle of a renovation. This is the room that we're gonna be setting up our most star tracker. So Moses makes a bunch of different size stars and it really does depend on the height of your ceiling. Our ceilings are about three meters high, which is roughly nine feet. Nine feet. For accuracy, many 3D applications, including Moses, rely on the metric system. So for those of you that are only familiar with the imperial system, buckle up, cowboy. The most important part about putting these stickers up is you don't want them to be in a grid, a straight line, or any uniform design. You want the stars to be placed in a random fashion to allow the star tracker to identify unique patterns in the stars. So when you open up your Mosa Star Tracker box, you're pretty much gonna see everything that you see here, with the most important being the Mosa Star Tracker itself, the sensor. The second most important piece here is the processor. It powers everything that you see here. It also is what your camera will sit on. There are newer versions of the Moses Star Tracker that are coming out soon, which will have a much smaller processor, but they all serve the same purpose. To connect your sensor to the processor, you need the umbilical cable. To power up the processor, you have the power supply. To see everything that the Moses Star Tracker sensor sees, there's a monitor. The touchscreen monitor allows you to set up your map and calibrate your Star Tracker. You can use the touchscreen or you can use the keyboard. In order to power the monitor and the keyboard and connect it to the processor, you need the HDMI slash USB cable. That allows you to get full control of the processor and configure it through this touchscreen monitor. To mount the monitor, you have the magic arm, and depending on the camera you have, you have your camera bracket. You can either use this one, which is specific to a Blackmagic camera, or you can use the generic one, which will fit on any camera. Then we have a big box full of accessories. This includes different mounting brackets, some Allen keys, Wi-Fi dongle, anything you need to fix any of the parts that you see here. And lastly, you have your optional lens encoder. This part alone allows you to capture the data from the lens that you're using. And these are all the parts you'll see in your Moses Star Tracker box. So, let's grab the processor and plug it all in. So the stars are all put up. Let's test it out and see how we did. First thing we'll do is pull the protective cover off of the Star Tracker, and then, We'll switch it on. It goes right into the only place that it fits here. Power supply goes underneath it. Then you have your HDMI cables that plug in from power supply to the monitor. So once the Star Tracker boots up, it's gonna go to a screen that looks like this. Don't worry, just give it a few seconds to load. And here we are. As you can see on the screen, we are already seeing stars on the ceiling. When you move the star tracker, it's picking up all of the dots on the ceiling. Moses has a general rule of thumb for their stars. The Moses star tracker will pick up approximately 30 stars in one single frame. The minimum it requires for operation is 11, but 14 stars is the minimum you should aim for. So as you can see in the top right corner here, the number we're seeing is 31. And as we move the star tracker around, that number is going to increase or decrease no matter on the height or position. So once we're all booted up and ready to go, the next step is creating a custom map. Once you create and load your map, you don't necessarily need the monitor plugged in anymore. But for reference, it's a very useful tool. So the first step of the Star Tracker mapping process is to put the Star Tracker on the floor. And we're gonna push it one foot at a time to allow the Star Tracker to orientate itself in the room and get a sense of scale and direction. We got it. All right, we pushed our Star Tracker 30 centimeters. We saved our movement and Moses told us that it was good. It was a good mapping job. We'll say optical failed or it will say good and good is the best. It sounds like it's not good, but it good is the best you can do, just so you know. The next step is finishing our map and the final calibration. This is where it gets fun. So grab your star tracker, power supply, and maybe a friend and walk around your studio collecting data on all the stars that you put up. You'll see at the top left of the screen, the number of stars will rise the more you continue to walk around. My tips on doing this, walk slowly and make sure you're changing the height at which you capture the stars, moving your arms in a steady wave pattern. A star has been collected and added to your map when it turns to a pink circle with a green cross in it. During the mapping stage, 
you can see the number of points or stars discovered and a keyframe number. Pay attention to this ratio. It's important for consistent optical stability. The goal is to have about a third of as many keyframes as you have discovered stars. Next, we're going to mark three targets on the floor, creating a right angle to represent the origin point, the x-axis, and the y-axis. These points are going to be determined from the perspective of the camera for your set. When we're putting up systems, the first point down is usually the origin point. This works as an anchor point to ensure that the x-axis and the y-axis are perfectly perpendicular to each other. It's easier if your origin point is centered on your stage. A laser angle comes in handy to ensure you're as accurate as possible when calibrating. The next target we add falls along the y-axis. In relation to the origin point, this target should be moving towards where your talent, LED wall, or green screen are located. That's positive y. The final point we'll add will follow along the x-axis. This point should be in line with the origin point and moving to the right, positive x creating a 90 degree axis between the three points. The greater the distance between the origin and the XY axis points, the more accurate the tracking system will be. The minimum distance between the origin and the axis points should be half of your studio height. So with our three meter ceiling heights, the ideal distance would be 1.5 meters. Let's mount our star tracker on wherever it's convenient for your camera. In our studio, we use a Blackmagic Ursa G2, and this is important when it comes to the placement of your star tracker, but we'll get back to that in just a sec. Okay, star tracker is mounted, the X and Y coordinates are marked, and the stars are in the sky. Now, let's calibrate the star tracker so it knows exactly where in our physical space it is. Think of it like the star tracker getting its bearing. First, we need to input our offsets. This data is used to ensure that the tracking data is adjusted to reflect the difference between the camera sensors and the tracking sensors. Most cameras will usually have an indicator on the camera body showing where the camera's sensor is. That's this little icon here. Using a tape measure, get the distance in centimeters that the star tracker is away from that point. On our camera, it's mounted in line with the sensor of the camera body, so we only have offsets in the up and forward axis. But if you choose to have the star tracker to one of the sides of your camera, you will need to also accommodate a left or right offset. Pro tip, this is the point on the star tracker that you'll be measuring your distance from. It's not marked, but trust me on this. Why should you trust me? Nice. To match the virtual world to the physical world, we'll be using through lens calibration using the offsets and the targets we mapped on the floor. Next, in the auto aligner tab, we will assign coordinates to the first three points. The first being 0, 0, 0, our origin point. Using the distance of the origin point to our x-axis target, the second point will be 1.5, or in our case, 1.3, 0, 0. That's our x-axis. And using the distance of the origin point to our y-axis target, the third point will be 0, 1.5, or in our case, 1.3, 0. That's our y-axis. We'll be centering the target points through the camera lens from multiple perspectives. Setting up our camera in the first position, we can observe and mark the origin point. Without relocating the camera, we can observe and mark the other two points as well. It's important that the optical tracking remains good throughout the whole process. Now you'll want to repeat this process from different camera locations around your studio. Best practice being between four to six observations from different locations. Beside each point on your monitor, you'll see the letters A, P, T, and D. These stand for angle, pan, tilt, and distance. After the first observation, if there is enough of a change in any of these data sets, the correlating letter will disappear from that target. Ideally, for optimal calibration, all the letters will disappear from each point, showing that you've captured a good range of perspectives for each point. Once you're happy with your observations, you can run the calibration. You should get a message that says, calibration succeeded, and an error rate. Anything less than one is acceptable for the error rate. We typically don't like to operate on anything above 0.5. However, for this example, we're settling with 1.2. Apply the calculations to your offsets. Now you can verify your accuracy through the verifier tab by looking at your points again. The system can tell which points in the virtual space you're looking at. Now your system is calibrated and ready for all your camera tracking needs. Good luck. The next step for this, it's getting it set up in Unreal Engine. Like and subscribe to see that video next.